Our panel tonight, this is really a good topic. This is really a solid topic. Real estate financing, an overview of current lending conditions. The evolution of this conference really came about as Albert Nunziata and I had discussions with George Canis of UBS Financial Services. So that being said, George is going to bat lead off. George and his associate, Henry Dreyer, if that's okay with you guys. We will call upon you to give your impressions, and then the remainder of the panel will give their respective impressions, and then we'll have a question and answer period. George and UBS Financial Services have been members of the BRI since 2012. George is a Senior Vice President of Wealth Management and a Senior Portfolio Manager of his company's Portfolio Management Program. As I mentioned earlier, he is joined this evening by his associate, Henry Dreyer. So at this point, we'll turn it over to George and Henry, and they will begin the event. Okay. Uh, hi, as, as uh, Albert and Jeff had said, my name is George Harris. I'm with uh, UBS Financial Services and White Plains. Uh, I'm a financial advisor and a wealth management practice. And basically what that means as a wealth management uh, advisor is that uh, we offer comprehensive uh, investment advice, financial planning to our clients. This includes not only investments, but retirement planning, estate planning, and the topic of tonight's discussion, liability management. And we're going to talk specifically about how to use your investment portfolio to finance excuse me, a number of things, including real estate financing, business inventories, personal acquisitions, and so on, in a, in a manner which is very cost-effective, uh, flexible, and very easy to set up. I'm um, very fortunate to have my colleague, Henry Dreyer, Henry is a specialist in this area, he's a director with the firm, and Henry is one of the many resources I have within the firm who offers specialized advice and guidance for my clients. So I'm going to turn it over to Henry, he's going to talk more about security-based lending and how this might work for some of you uh, in, in your uh, financing strategies. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. So th this might be financing that's a little different than the typical, you know, commercial mortgage financing or real estate financing that you are, you know, used to. Um, what we do at UBS is, you know, with George's expertise, asset management, we'll provide liquidity against clients' portfolios. So we'll look at a client's account, you know, equities, bonds. We'll establish a different lending value of those securities. So, for example, a uh, a diversified portfolio of equities will get a 70% release, so you can borrow 70% against that. Bonds, if they're more conservative, high quality, we can lend as high as 95% against. Um, it's really the most efficient, convenient, cost-effective way to borrow. These lines take off maybe a week to set up. You sign a couple of forms. There's no fees. There's no closing costs. Um, the pricing is very aggressive. We base our rates off of what the loan's approved for. So for example, if you had a million and a half dollar diversified equity portfolio, where we'll lend 70%, we can provide a million fifty thousand dollar line of credit. Uh, we have a pricing break point of a million dollars, so meaning if you get your line approved for a million dollars, you qualify for a rate of a 30 day LIBOR plus 2.75%. Does anyone here know what, where 30 day LIBOR is at today? Is that something? 15, great. 15 basis points, 15, 16. So, so we're talking, you're close. We'll give you credit. One basis point at the play slide. Um, so we're talking at an all in lending rate of 2.9% on a million dollar line of credit. And that's not to say you need to borrow a million dollars. It's just that's what you're approved for. And then you can draw whatever you would need off of that line and still get the million dollar rate. And as the, the value the, of the, you know, as the loan approval gets higher, the rates drop. So something over a $10 million approval for a very large loan, the rate would be at 1.9%. I think you all have a, uh, there's a rate sheet on your tables that show you the different pricing rate points um, where we price our loans. So we see a lot of clients use these lines for real estate transactions, and it doesn't necessarily have to be just to, for the entire purchase of the real estate, but they do see that. Um, but it might just be for the equity down payment. So, you know, you might want to take out a commercial mortgage for 70% of the value, but maybe you have, you know, you don't want to liquidate your portfolio, it's performing well, you want to stay invested in the market, you have gains, you don't want to take a, you know, a tax hit. So we'll provide 
you know, those equity down payment against your securities, and you can still go out and get a commercial mortgage. Um, what we see a lot of is our clients typically own the assets in their personal name, but they might want to buy the piece of real estate in an LLC name. So we'll have a client pledge their personal account, but we'll open the line of credit in the name of their business, of their LLC. So, if, you know, it's a little cleaner for tax purposes. At the end of the year, they'll get their monthly interest, their annual interest statement in the LLC name. At the end of the day, they're still individually guaranteeing that loan. And, you know, the one thing I want to make clear is uh, being against securities, you do still need to maintain a level of value to, to collateralize that loan. And if, if it drops below a, a certain level, there would be a, a margin call. So we always want to kind of be conservative and make sure there's enough assets, a well diversified portfolio, because we don't want to get to that situation. But we, we see a lot of clients use these pleasure assets and then borrow in, in the name of their LLC. So it's, it's a very it's a very common transaction, um, you know. But you can theoretically use these lines of credit for anything. It doesn't have to just be real estate. It can be. We see a lot of uh, wealthy clients help family members out. It might be you know helping a grandkid start a business where they don't want to just give them a half a million dollars so they'll pleasure securities. But it happens. I'm telling you, it's a great world to be in. <laughs> But we, we see a lot of, so we can do, a, you know, any, any type of third-party pledging. Um, it's a, you know, it's a great way to avoid any type of real estate taxes because these are liens against the securities, not your portfolio. So, uh, you know, it, it's very convenient. Um, the way the interest works is, it's a variable rate loan, like I said, tied to LIBOR. But where the flexibility comes is, we don't require, actually, monthly payments. So if interest does hit on a monthly basis, um, we always advise our clients to, to make, make a monthly payment, but in theory, you don't have to, so it's, it's very flexible. We have clients who will buy a property, do improvements, and then look to sell them, and they don't want to put any cost, you know, money during that time period. So they'll borrow, they'll, you know, borrow more to do the construction phase of the project, complete it, never make a payment during this time, sell the property, and then one fell swoop, just pay off the line of credit. So, so it's, it's a, it really is a fantastic, you know, way to way to borrow. It's much easier. We don't get into tax returns. We don't get into cash flow statements. Um, you know, that's. Am I missing anything, George? Yeah, I would just add that um, because some of the members here are also in in businesses too, and uh, the point about credit lines, business inventories, and how you know can be used in that regard. Yeah, we, we see a lot of clients who are uh, business owners who don't have. So if they're going to go to a regular bank, they're going to you know. Uh, probably pay a rate of prime plus something, you know, have uh, fees tied to that, have to, you know, give cash flow statements, tax returns. We, we can take uh, the business owner who pledges assets, we'll open the line of credit in the name of the business. We don't ask for any of that other stuff. There's not going to be any fees. There's not an annual cleanup for 30 day cleanup at the end of each year. So when we, you know, when we help a, a business owner finance the business this way, they, they're just ecstatic because it's so much easier to, to deal with us as a lender, um, and we're, you know, essentially, once you set the line of credit up, it's approved. You don't need to use it, so it's not like at the time of, of approving it, you have to borrow it at that point. So we have a lot of our clients who just establish the line of credit. They like having it available because you never know what's going to come up, and if they ever knew, need it, they know it's there to borrow against. And if they never use it, it never costs them a dollar. So it's a free, you know, it's a free line of credit until you tap into it. And once you tap into it, you're just essentially paying interest on what you borrow. So, you know, I think I think it's suitable. I, you know, as a as a the lending specialist at UBS, I try to have George set up all his clients with lines of credit because I think it's a always important to have liquidity available. Um, some, you know, if the market goes up and it goes down, and sometimes it's not the right day to sell. And if you need money that day, it's nice to know that you can just borrow against it and always clean it up. And one last thing George, that George and I talked about is we see a lot of bridge financing. So, you know, a client might list their uh, a property for sale. It's not going to close until December. They're looking to buy a property and they need to buy it in September. Well, we can, you know, borrow against securities to bridge that three month gap. The fact that there's no fees or closing costs and an extremely competitive interest rate makes it by far the most cost of way, effective way to, to bridge that gap. So, um, Hopefully, I guess we'll do Q and A at the end if anyone has any questions. So, uh, thank you. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, George, and thank you, Henry. 
Our next speaker is Jerry Houlihan of Houlihan Barnes Realtors. Jerry is certainly no stranger to the membership of the BRI. He has served as chairman of the BRI's Apartment Owners Advisory Council and is a member of our association's board of trustees. He is a senior director of sales at Houlihan Parnes, which as you all know is a leading real estate company in our region and a longtime member of the BRI. Please welcome Jerry Houlihan. Thank you, Jeff. Um, we're, we're a company that uh, strictly does commercial real estate. We own and operate um, our own portfolio of office buildings, retail properties, multifamily buildings, um, and a couple of industrial buildings. Um, and then we also do mortgage brokerage for uh, third parties. So I'm going to speak directly uh, to uh, the commercial real estate lending environment. Um, I guess over the first quarter of 2014, we've seen an uptick in some of the sales activity. And then competition from local savings banks has increased for owner-occupied investment, retail, office buildings, as well as some industrial buildings. The CMBS market and the um, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac agencies have dominated the mortgage origination in the multifamily markets, although a lot of borrowers now um, will go to a local savings bank because the interest rates are so competitive to avoid the paperwork, the higher costs, um, and uh, some of the other legal and administrative costs that go with that. Um, and the lending policies, although are still strict, have somewhat eased over the, uh, I guess, the last year, the first quarter of this year, um, where there was any credit issues with a borrower, you know, there was, uh, banks would uh, decline, decline uh, uh, lending any money. But now they're, they're starting to entertain different things, um, and we'll get creative with it. For instance, I'm doing a, um, I'm doing a strip of, uh, a retail strip on Yonkers Avenue, Yonkers, where the borrower has a credit issue, and we were able to negotiate a little bit higher of an interest rate and a little reserve, and it looks like we're going to be closing the loan soon. Um, some of the other things that they'll look for if there's um, a little bit of hair on the deal is, you know, uh, making sure that the lease expirations on either the office tenancy or the retail tenancy is coterminous with the terminal loan, so there's no exposure at the end. Um, they'll look for a healthy debt coverage ratio of 1.3 or better. The typical loan to values are anywhere from 60 up to 75% loan to value. Um, and they look for structurally sound properties with little or no deferred maintenance. Um, the typical spreads that we're seeing um, from savings banks and as well as the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac lenders are about 150 um, to about 175 basis points over the treasury bills or the swap rates. And then you go up maybe another 25 basis points or 50 basis points for office buildings and industrial buildings. Um, and I just wanted to kind of read off some of the deals that we've done to give you an idea. Uh, we did a 51,000 square foot shopping center up in Unionville, Connecticut. 4% with on a 30 year schedule at par for five years. Um, we did a $20 million loan on the Grand Concourse on a uh, former Verizon building. And uh, that rate was about 4%. Again, 30 year schedule. Uh, both of these deals were done at par. Um, a small building in New Rochelle, non-recourse, 600,000, five years, uh, four and a quarter percent, 30 year schedule. And what else today? And we have a, uh, it's an apartment house in White Plains, seven, seven point eight million, three point seven five percent on a seven year term, 30 year schedule, um, declining prepayment penalty, and this is also done in part. The most competitive rates, obviously, are for multifamily buildings. We've seen them as low as three and a quarter percent for five years of par um, at about 70, 75 percent loan to value. Um, and I guess I can answer questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Chris, okay, great. One of our more active members at the BRI is Vincent Mugarelli, who's a vice president with Capital One Bank. Capital One has been a member of our association since 2006, and we're grateful that Vincent uh, has helped us uh, get 
Chris Economides to be part of our panel this evening. Uh, Chris is a marketing credit executive and a senior vice president with Capital One. And again, we'd like to express many thanks to Vincent Mudrelli for arranging for Chris to be with us. Chris, it's all yours. Thanks, Jen. Thank I'll, we'll rotate from uh, the table here up to the podium. So it's my turn to be up back up on the podium. So uh, thank you, everyone, for having uh, me here tonight to uh, speak. Uh, that gratitude also goes to my associate, uh, Vincent Mutarelli, who's a great advocate for all the business here in uh, Westchester County. Uh, he really is an advocate for the customers here, and he speaks and he works very well with them. So basically, I'm the market credit executive for Capital One. I'm responsible for all credit sales and business banking for the Lower Hudson Valley, Connecticut, and the state of New Jersey, and I cover 18 bankers, but none of them keep me as busy as Vinny. <laughs> and, and, and we basically lend into four sectors. Uh, we do traditional uh, C&I lending, commercial lending, which covers term loans, lines of credits for operating companies. And then secondly, we, we lend uh, to those prop owners who may own their building. Secondly, we do investor real estate. And what kind of investor real estate do we do? Well, we do multifamily. We do industrial properties, office buildings, self-storage properties shadow anchored retail, and credit tenant properties. Of course, the most attractive property right now to lend into is the uh, multifamily properties because one of the key aspects we look at in lending is the vacancy rate. A multifamily in Westchester County right now is about 7.5% vacancy. And according to some statistics that I got from uh, CB Richard Ellis, office properties, to give you an idea, are at about 19% vacancy rate here in Westchester County. So naturally, that, that type of lending is more risky than, than multifamily lending. Uh, finally, we, we will do uh, lending to condominium associations. That's a unique specialty that uh, Capital One has because when we're lending to condominium associations, there's no underlying real estate collateral. We're lending to the corporation, a non-for-profit corporation that just owns the common elements of the association, whereas the individual units have an underlying deed and mortgage, mortgage, separate mortgage financing. So it's unsecured type of lending and we do lend into that market and we're one of the few lenders that do that type of lending. And finally, we do SBA lending for the folks uh, who cannot come up with the traditional down payments required like a 25% down payment on a property. Capital One will finance up to 90% of that property acquisition and will spread that and it will be a straight 25 year loan. Within our own, one of the things with, on any types of these loans, Capital One retains its entire book that we originate. We're not selling our, our loans out to the marketplace, so we retain it. If, if Vinny originates a loan, he's going to service that loan for the life of the loan, and he's going to be the go-to person, and it, it's, it's not going to be someone you have to re-explain the whole loan to. It will be Vinny and then perhaps myself dealing with, with the client. We, uh, so that gives us some more flexibility in dealing with clients we've done. That allows us to do rate modifications to keep a great client, uh, just extend the terms. Uh, we uh, love lending into the professional services market to accountants, attorneys, doctors, and we will even go higher in our loan-to-value ratios because we love that market because the rate of default is so low in, in that market right now. Some of the types of properties that are tough to do are the specialty properties, the single tenant properties where there's not a credit tenant, but it's, it's always worth a discussion with us. Uh, Capital One, just, just a quick plug on Capital One. Vinny and I come from North Fork Bank, which was acquired by Capital One in 2006. North Fork Bank was just a true commercial lending bank, so Capital One wanted to get into that business besides just you may know knowing Capital One by, by what's in your wallet or a lot more than that. So I'll be happy to uh, take any Q&A at the end and I'll turn, turn it over to the next speaker, Jen. Thank you, Chris. Thanks again, Chris.
The final presentation from our panel tonight will come from Jim Land Frankie of Webster Bank. Webster Bank has been a member of the BRI since 2012. Jim is a senior associate with Webster and he's been active with our association since that time. He has spoken at several BRI meetings and seminars and has helped represent the BRI and its component group, the Apartment Owners Advisory Council, in issues affecting the AOAC, which is the abbreviation for the Apartment Owners Advisory Council. Um, Jim is, again, is a very active member and we're very, very pleased he was able to join us this evening. Please welcome Jim Lynn, Frankie Webster Bank. Um, what I want to start out by is introducing Webster Bank to you because a lot of you may not know about Webster Bank. Uh, Webster Bank is the largest uh, New England based commercial bank. Uh, we're based in Waterbury, Connecticut, founded in 1934 by William Webster Smith. Um, borrowed 25 grand from his friends and family. But you can imagine, if he borrowed 25 grand in 1934, he probably had money himself. Um, so he founded this bank, and it was a single branch bank until 1959. So if you remember uh, It's a Wonderful Life, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. this was the building alone. This was the building alone. William Webster Smith took money from the people in Waterbury, Connecticut, the people who worked in those factories, and lent it back out to the businesses and homeowners at the time. And that's what we based our business on. In 1959, he opened a second branch in Waterbury. In the mid-60s, his son, uh, Jim Smith, who was now our chairman, joined the bank. And <coughs> as most children are wont to do, had a better idea. And he grew the bank and started opening up branch offices, took the bank public. We are now a $20 billion bank based between, uh, based, still based in Waterbury, but located with 180 branches between Boston and the Bronx. Next year we hope to be opening another office in the Bronx, and we just received lending authority in Rockland County, the Bronx, Manhattan, Queens, and Brooklyn. Okay? What we do well, what we really do well, is lending to businesses and lending to investment real estate. And I was asked to talk about what the current market is. Okay, so now you know a little bit about Webster Bank. By the way, we have, currently have eight branches in Westchester County, if that means something to you. Um, Scarsdale. Although, Scarsdale, Scarsdale. Yeah. <laughs> although most of our cu customers don't go to branches. We, we, do, uh, we try to get people to bank without, without branches and it works well, but in any case. Um, what we do well is investment real estate lending. And I was asked to talk about the climate for investment real estate lending. Um, what we've seen basically is that when the, when the snowpack melted, mm -hmm. the buyers have come out. And that people are coming back to the marketplace looking to buy buildings. And yes, investment uh, in, in residential real estate is always hot. There's, the cap rates are great. It's something that people really want, they, they understand, they understand people need a place to live. Uh, but Nick pointed out a year ago that the real focus of the next five, ten years is not going to be on residential real estate because uh, the business community is building up again. And one of the areas that's lacking is flex space, is that warehouse space and industrial space. Nick and I do a lot of lending in the South Bronx and industrial parts of Westchester County where there are not a lot of vacancies and there's not a lot of properties for sale. So if you're an investor and are interested in, in lending, or excuse me, in, interested in borrowing or buying in, the, in that space, there's a lot of opportunities to get involved. Um, both as an investor, as an owner-occupier as, owner as well. One of the things that Webster is keen on, and I think most of the banks in this room will talk about, we don't lend to buildings. So if you come to me and tell me that you have terrible credit, and you have very little put down, and you have very little liquidity, but you're giving me a 30% loan to value, you're really not interested. I'm not lending to a building, I'm lending to an individual. 
We like to see people with good credit. We like to see professional owners and operators, people who have experience, people who have liquidity so that if they do lose a tenant or they suffer a casualty loss that's not fully covered by insurance, that they can survive six months of a rent debt. In terms of interest rates, we are doing, Webster Bank anyway, is doing a lot of swap contracts. And an interest rate swap simply exchanges the risk, the interest rate risk, from the borrower to the bank or a third party. And what that means is there are no prepayment penalties provided interest rates don't go down. What do we say the... Uh, what did we say the interest rate was on the 30 month line board? 15 basis points? Yeah. Okay. 15 basis points. If you think the 30 month line board is going to go below that, then don't take a swap contract because you're not going to win. But if you do, if you do bet against it, the bank is going to hold that risk. Okay. Um, as far as other interest rates and what, what's happening in the rest of the market, I'm, I'm very bearish on interest rates. Everybody thinks the interest rates are going up. And uh, a lot of the bankers that I work with feel the same way because we understand that if, if interest rates went to five and a half, six and a half, seven and a half percent, then the federal government would be paying the same interest rates. And I think you know that we can't afford that. So as long as they can afford to print money, interest rates, it's in the, in the country's best interest for interest rates to stay low. Um, I think we're all very bullish. I th everybody in this room, I think, is all very bullish on the, on the uh, investment real estate and owner-occupied real estate. If you have an opportunity to buy a piece of property now, it's a great time to buy. Interest rates are perfect. Uh, the lending climate has improved dramatically. Uh, we, uh, so the, several of the panelists talked about how it's eased. Um, I don't know that it's eased all that much. We're, we're, we're just focusing on people with very good credit. You know, the, the federal government is focused on the kind of credits that we issue because they now believe that, or, or they've impressed, to, uh, impressed upon us that we're not lending our money. If you're federally insured, you're lending the federal government's money. So you're going to lend to our criteria, not the bank's criteria. So if you know somebody who's been turned down for a loan and they complain about it, for the most part, the bank is not turning them down. It's the regulators that are saying, you can't make that loan because if it doesn't stand on its own, you can't make it. Um, I think I've answered every question I could about uh, Webster Bank. Um, I hope I've spoken enough about what the lending climate is like. And if you have any questions, uh, Nick Mara, who's the new regional manager for Fairfield, Westchester, and everything south, is here as well. <coughs> the little patch of real estate uh, in the New York metropolitan area. We're here to answer your questions. One last, one last joke, one last comment. If you owe the bank, a hundred dollars. That's your problem. If you owe the bank a hundred million dollars, that's the bank's problem. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Questions? The floor is now open. This is your chance. Anyone? What's that question? Yes. Yes, sir. You know, I just just uh, uh, being, being out here in the audience, I know. Could you identify yourself? He's Italian. Yes, my name is Harry Grant. You know, sometimes the lingo kind of gets away from us, and it, you know, uh, politicians use beltway, beltway speak, and all that. But when you use the term "par," exactly, you know, for benefit of the audience. Uh, what does that mean? I know, I know it was used by a Jerry. Jeff, Jerry. Yes, well, the par simply means that the bank isn't charging a commitment fee. That's all it is. I mean, they'll, they'll you know, you'll have legal fees associated with it. You'll have um, processing fees, uh, but 
you know, at times they'll charge you a commitment fee. If they quote you par, they're not charging you a commitment fee. No points. No points. Any other? Anyone else? Nothing to do with my golf game. Gene Gene, anyone on the panel? How do you, how do you, what kind of advice do you give an individual who wants to develop a property, a vacant lot? What's the best strategy in today's market to developing a vacant lot? Life securities. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would just add, well, after they get the uh, securities loan and they want the securities back, they can come to Capital One for a loan. I would say if somebody's looking to uh, develop a vacant lot, you really have to do a thorough market analysis in what you're looking to uh, develop on that lot. As I mentioned, uh, here in Westchester County, the vacancy rate on uh, multifamily property is about 7.5%. So your ability to get that property stabilized, meaning rent it up, is far easier to do so than if you had commercial office space where the vacancy factor in commercial office space is about 17.5%, and it was a few years ago up in the low 20s. So that makes the office space market a buyer's market today, whereas if you're developing a multi-family lot, it's, it's, an owner's, it, it, it's an owner's market. So that, that's one of the major things one has to take into consideration when they're developing a lot. And then, of course, the local zoning and the, and the local variances of, of within that marketplace. Jane, I mean, the, 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 the first part of the problem, and it's, a, it's an appraisal problem, right? an appraisal problem. The first part of the problem is, what's the highest and best use for that property? The highest and best use for that property might be a parking lot. The highest and best use of that property may be a vacant lot because the, the real estate market in that area may be changing dynamically. There may be dynamic changes that are going on where you, you're better off sitting back and looking at it. If, if you're in an industrial area, you definitely don't want to build an apartment building. If, if you are in an office, an office area, you definitely don't want to build a manufacturing facility. It's to, to, to my colleague's point, you want to look at what the, what the, the zoning allows, but the, the, uh, the appraisal problem is called the highest and best use. What is the highest and best use of that specific property? And that's where you would start. What's next door? What's down the block? What's coming? What, what's coming See, in the future? That's the big question that I think people miss right now with multi-family construction. Is right now, I know it's a hot product, you know, you're looking and you're seeing rents going up, and that's great, but what ends up happening a lot of times in the, in the, in the construction business, in general, with multifamily, is uh, you're, you're basing your project on what's going on right now in the market, instead of what's going to be going on when your project is finished. And that could be a crucial element to success or failure, because, you know, obviously we've all seen that salaries are not going up. And every way you look, multifamily is definitely going up. I mean, if you go down to Hoboken, it used to be an area where, I know when I was going through college, everybody graduated college went to Hoboken. You enjoyed every bar there until you got a real job in Manhattan, and then you commuted into Manhattan every day, or maybe got an apartment in Manhattan. Well, Hoboken's not like that anymore. Now you got young professionals with kids in Hoboken, and there are actual builders down in Hoboken that think they can get 1.2 to 1.3 million in condos, or three, three bedroom condos in Hoboken, which you would have never thought uh, 20 years ago. You were, you were scoffed at. But you know you do have a mayor in Manhattan that seems to like the tax code, and that seems to be pushing a lot of people out into areas like Stanford, into areas like Westchester, into areas like New Jersey. But you got to, you know, it, it's also, you're starting to see a ton of real estate going up. And just like anything else, supply and demand. If you get into that marketplace and all of a sudden all these other buildings are going up and now rental prices that you thought you were going to get are not what you're going to get now because it's just that there, there's, there's places to rent everywhere. And you're also anticipating that most people that are young are not buying houses right now. They're a little scared of the housing market. They're scared of what the house is going to be worth. They're scared of property taxes. That fear might not always exist in a couple of years. Um, so those are kind of things that, that you know, you, you get caught up in a project and, and it looks great and you see what's going on, but it's really 
you know, in, in my estimation, and, and Jim touched on it earlier, is my feeling is, is that nobody's putting up a commercial warehouse right there. Nobody's putting up spaces, and you have apartments going up everywhere. But people still need to get goods and services into the boroughs, into Queens, into Brooklyn, into where, where is it going to come from? So, you know, there is a, a lot of space that's out there right now. And I think if, 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 you, if you got a smart investment hat on, I think there's a lot of room in the, in the uh, industrial and, and, and heavy commercial areas. Because there's not many areas left, and certainly there's not a mayor that you can think of that's saying, please bring your warehouse space over here. We'd love to have you here. And please bring your uh, trucks and everything else here. But you know what? You need trucks to supply product to people. And, uh, you'd be surprised in a year what, what, what the market might look like. You don't want to be late to the game. And, you know, I'm starting to feel like uh, people are going to get stuck in way to the game as uh, multi-families move. Mr. Lester. Yeah, I believe the gentleman's question was, what's the best way to finance, finance vacant yeah. land? And you finance vacant land without any approvals. The approval process takes a long time. And I would say the best way to finance vacant land is the way the founder of Webster Bank financed the bank initially. And that is, go to your friends and relatives and you do it all with equity, no debt. Because you have no idea how long it's going to take and the carrying cost with the taxes and the approval process and then interest and debt service on top of that uh, becomes very difficult for the landowner to carry. So my advice would be to do it all with equity. It's great, it's great if you can do that. And I will tell you that getting a development loan from a traditional lender is very difficult. Um, we want to see experienced developers. If you come and say, you know, I got this piece of property and I think I could build a house on it or an apartment building or a factory, it's, it's not going to go very far because we want to see experienced developers. We want to see people who know how to make a project from beginning to end. And that's the key. Um, and also, if, if the project costs $5 million and you're looking to borrow $4.5 million, well, that means that I own the pro that we own the project and you're, we're going to lease it back to you. What we're looking for is somebody to come with us Say, here, I got all this cash, I only need another million dollars to do it. Um, and that's the, it's like what people always say, banks only want to lend money to people who don't need it. No, we want to lend people money to people who need it, but who also understand what they're borrowing and why they're borrowing. Banks primarily lend against cash flow. If you look at doing a home mortgage loan for somebody, the bank's going to qualify that individual on a home mortgage based upon their income. They're going to look at a debt to income ratio on the house. On, on the borrower and then take an underlying value uh, on the home. It's the same thing with a business loan or real estate loan. The preferred loans in, in today's market are those properties that have are stabilized and are generating a, a cash flow. Something like a bit, like you said, uh, borrow money from family or friends. There, there's uh, non-bank lending institutions, venture capital, that will lend in to these vacant lands if they like the property, well, but they're going to take an equity position. Well, yeah, well, that's what I'm talking yes. about is equity. Yes. So that there is no debt service. Right, because when a bank lends into a property, we're not getting the equity upside. On. We're, we're getting our 3 4 5% return on the loan, but we're not participating in that property's uh, growth in that property's value, whereas an equity investor would. I'm very dangerous. I've been out with you. Are there any more questions? Burn is big. I actually want to make a mistake. Can you stand, Mona? Yeah. So we can hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Here we go. Thank you, Jim. Go ahead, Mona. You can do it. You're up. Many years ago, Long Island City was poison. Tenements, very poor area, buildings falling down, probably building built up in the 18th, before 1900. I, I, I was in, working with some attorneys in real estate at that time, but they kept saying, 
late 70s or the early 80s. Oh, we only had a lot of money to buy a lot of those buildings that had to be torn down. But somebody did buy them. And Long Island City now is a suburb of Manhattan. And I, I'd like to know how that happens. Because the bank system, the private people, and Long Island City is just gold. I'm not an urban planner, but uh, I read maps like I read maps like most people read novels. And if you look at the uh, transportation network, specifically the E, the F, and the Seven train, the E, the F, and the Seven were the answer to why, and 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 Long Island Railroad to some extent, but the E, the F, and the Seven, which have one, they're one stop away from Midtown. The, that's the reason why Long Island City grew the way it do, did. That's why Citibank built that 45-story, uh, excuse me, 50-story tower. I worked there for a while. One stop away from their other, from their headquarters. And if you if you're looking at, you know, where the future is going, I think we've pretty much stopped on on expanding out into the suburbs because. I remember as an appraiser 10 years ago, looking at, at uh, the Durst organization and other organizations taking options on property in northern Dutchess County and trying to figure out where the people who were buying these houses were going to work. And were they going to work in, in, uh, in Albany? Because you were almost closer to Albany. You were almost equidistant. Uh, were they betting on the fact that there was going to be high-speed rail? to take people down, because high-speed rail is not, you know, it's too far away. By the way, the Durst organization, all those organizations have bought these long-term commitments, long-term options, and they've all gave, given them up. The, the, that property's still not going to be developed, but what's going to be developed is my kids, who grew up in northern Westchester, have no desire, and all their friends, by the way, have no desire to live in the suburbs. None. Everybody wants to live in the city. Right? If you look at it, Jim, well, there's a lot of vacant, large, yeah. industrial, corporate office space, industrial space, corporate campuses that are vacant in all of these suburban counties. If you look in uh, Bergen County, North Jersey, expected to underperform in the office and multi-family housing and industrial markets. Bronx is considered to be average. Brooklyn, average. Manhattan's going to outperform, continue is expected to continue to outperform the market. All the outlying suburbs, Westchester, underperform. So it's, it goes back to what you said, Jim, about the boroughs of New York, and, and the four boroughs are, are expected to remain. Queens, Brooklyn, and, and, and the Bronx are all expected to outperform the suburban markets. Don't leave that spot on the very same. <laughs> no, Staten Island. No, the boroughs is, is performing. All, all the four boroughs is are doing much better than the outlying suburbs of Bergen, Westchester. Well, I just want to say if there are no further questions, we covered urban planning, questions. economics, <laughs> and whatever. I have time for one more question. Stand up, identify thyself, and project. Steve has Keller Williams Realty. Yay. <laughs> Uh, would you attribute to the uh, the lack of progression into the into the suburbs at this point because of the tax the, the tax base the cost versus in the boroughs? Is that uh, versus let's say Westchester? Uh, I, I think numbers, the Rochelle industrial. Why why would that not be moving out because of the taxes? I don't know. I, I can only speak from my perspective, and I think the perspective. If I look around the room, the perspective of most of the people who who are in this room. Right. I think most of us probably grew up in in either Down County or Metropolitan or in New York City. I grew up in the Bronx. Same okay. here. Washington Heights. Washington Heights. My wife grew up in Washington Heights. <laughs> you know, I would have loved to bought a to have bought a house in Riverdale. I couldn't afford it. Okay. I went first to New Rochelle and to Scarsdale, you know, kept moving at White Plains, and finally, Pound Ridge, I found something that was cheap enough for me to buy. Um, 
But now, and, and that was the reason I did it. It was just house, home prices were lower. Uh, I can't afford to stay there, honestly. I think probably right. by the time I retire, site, but ta it, it, taxes are, taxes are going to be a major factor. Right. But here's a bigger factor. When my son was getting ready to go to college, and I suggested that he go to purchase, as soon as he purchased, because he could commute, he told me, Daddy, I'm leaving here in September and I'm never coming back. <laughs> and the reason, I said, why did you say that? He said, because this is like growing up on a desert island with trees. He said, there's nothing here. And if you watch modern TV, and if, you're, if, you, if you look at social media, it's all about interacting and, and communicating with people. And if you're in the suburbs, your ability to do that is limited, you know? What everybody's looking for is the ability to interact with others that you can't get in the suburbs, that you can get in the city. Because that's what you see on TV, that's what you see in media, social, whether it's social media or, or the public media. That's what you see. You hit the nail on the head. Everybody wants to be one, one stop away on the subway or one stop away on the train. Exactly. Well, we're coming up on 840. I, you know, I have to say, just on a personal note, I don't understand all this uh, suburban bashing. I, I grew up in the country. I was born in Mount Vernon, raised in Mount Vernon. You know, I, I just, uh, Mount Vernon is the country? <laughs> I was waiting for somebody to laugh. A couple of, uh, uh, before I turn it over to Jeff to wrap up and thank our guests, a couple of uh, uh, extra announcements. One, if you haven't gotten your parking sticker, please see Jeff. Uh, after the meeting and get it, otherwise we'll cover the parking, but if you don't get your sticker, you'll have to cover it. Secondly, any guests or members who do not fill out either a yellow or green card, just please come up and fill one out for us. It just helps us to keep tabs on the actual attendance uh, when we have to settle the billing with, uh, with uh, the Crown Plaza. And let me, and we were remiss, hold on one second, don't anybody leave? Uh, we were remiss in trying to get the program going. We forgot to acknowledge both our president, Eric Abraham, oh. and, and our chairman, Mike Goldon. And uh, thank you to all the directors of the, of the heads of the five families who may be out there. And uh, let me turn it over to Jeff for a final uh, adjournment. Thanks, Albert. Once again, our next general membership meeting is May 15th here at 6.30. Please uh, keep an eye out for that and other notices on our meetings and programs. Please help me in thanking Jerry Houlihan, Jim Lamb Frankie, Chris Lamadinis, Tony Drug, and George Hannes. Thank you all for your job. Everyone have a good week.